What is going on, everybody? Welcome into the season finale of Studs and Duds, where today we're going to be talking about the rising and falling players from the NFC Conference from weeks 13 up until the Wild Card Weekend. I appreciate your patience. This is a pretty massive endeavor here. Make sure you guys also go back to last week's video where we did the AFC Conference. And if you are new here and you're wondering what this series is about, well, we go team by team. We talk about who's playing well, who's not playing well. And while we do that, I show you actually the ratings changes from my own custom Madden roster that I've been doing for six years now. Uh, so those ratings, while they are a video game, do accurately show my perceptions of these players and they are derived from the actual film that I've watched on these guys. So just letting you guys know what this video is all about. And if you enjoy this series, please do hit that like button down below. Really would appreciate it. Uh, also, consider supporting this channel and this series on my Patreon. That is patreon.com slash that franchise guy. This is the best time to sign up because you will get exclusive draft content. You'll get access to my full draft board. It's going to have player profiles on over 400 players. When all is said and done, first version of that should be up next week with the first 20, 25 players or so. And you'll also get access to film breakdowns. You'll support the channel in the process. And if you just enjoy the Madden side of this thing, if EA ever lets you actually download the damn thing because the file share has been broken since Christmas, <clears throat> thanks EA. Uh, if you enjoy my roster update, you want to contribute to my work, show your support, please do consider doing that. I'll leave my PayPal Venmo right there if you just look at my roster as a DLC type of addition to your Madden experience, I do ask that you consider that. Or, you know, just hit that like button. Go check out TFG Plays as well, my second YouTube channel where I do all of my Madden content. And if nothing else, just thank you for letting me plug all that stuff. And now let's go ahead and get started with Studs and Duds, where we're going to start with our star of the week. And it's going to be Micah Parsons the star of weeks 13 through the wild card weekend, even though the Cowboys disappointed a few days ago in the playoffs. But Micah Parsons really did steal this show uh, down this stretch, not just locking up defensive rookie of the year, but getting into the defensive player of the year conversation. And we're just lucky that we get to watch Micah Parsons, a special athlete and, and unique football player because of the role that he plays. Obviously, he makes splash highlight plays that are fun to watch, but for fans of X's and O's and schemes in football, Micah Parsons is, is truly unique because he is genuinely someone that can play two different positions at an extremely high level as a pass rusher and as a linebacker. Now, you can line him straight up on the edge. You can blitz him as a linebacker. His contribution as a pass rusher to this Cowboys team is is really where he was elite year one and how he got into the defensive player of the year conversation. His a, a rip move alone, just with his burst and power at his size, it's just incredibly difficult to block, especially when he comes as a blitzing linebacker. Um, but he can, you know, he can rush with, with that power off the edge as well. And then they can just have him drop into coverage and uh, patrol sideline to sideline in the run game where in space he is already one of the most intimidating, fast, uh, just run and chase linebackers in the league. So pass rushing is already, uh, dare we say, elite. Uh, his run defense to me is, is already tops in the league. And then in coverage, for relative to a rookie linebacker, he's really good in coverage as well. And he got better as the year went on. We saw him uh, the first game of the year, you know, play action. Tom Brady drops it right over his head. You know, we haven't seen that as much. He's playing with more patience on those baiting the linebacker types of plays by, by these offenses. And he's able to man guys up and, and run the correct match assignments. Like he is truly developing as a cover player, which is just scary. I mean, the sky is the limit for Micah Parsons. Hall of Fame, all pros, you name it. That is where this guy is headed, If especially if he keeps it up. Uh, but had to highlight Micah Parsons for the Dallas Cowboys and, and give Cowboys fans something to celebrate after a disappointing weekend as well. And then our dud of this time is going to be O.J. Howard, tight end 
of the Tampa Bay Buccaneers, who has truly disappointed me. You know, he is this athletic specimen, 6'5", 250 pounds. He's not one of these hybrid, you know, undersized tight ends. And and just from the very core of it, he doesn't block. He, he doesn't play up to his size. And for that reason, he's had a hard time getting on the field. But then beyond that, you know, a lot of guys don't want to block. There's your Noah Fants and your Evan Ingrams and a lot of tight ends uh, that just aren't great blockers. But they make up for it with what they do in the receiving game and their athleticism and their ability as a mismatch guy. And for a while, it was like, okay, O.J. Hour just, he's not getting targets because you've got Chris Godwin there and you've got Antonio Brown there, Mike Evans, Gronk, Cameron Brait, Leonard Fournette out of the backfield. But now, no, no Godwin, no Antonio Brown, no Fournette. They need complimentary pass catchers to step up. And yes, I get that Brait is ahead of him, but there's no reason at this point for O.J. Howard to not see an increase in playing time and not just playing time. He needs to, because he is playing. He's not like benched or anything. He's just the third tight end. But there, if he really put his head down, there's no reason he shouldn't be a second receiving option for this team. With the amount of attention that Mike Evans and Gronk draw and his ability in the short to intermediate game paired with Tom Brady's excellence in that part of the field, I'm severely disappointed that OJ Howard hasn't stepped up with this opportunity. And I, dare I say, he's just a soft player that isn't figuring things out. Uh, I do question his work ethic at this point. I, I wonder if he's just coasting on this Super Bowl team because they need somebody to step up and he hasn't been able to do that in a contract year nonetheless. So maybe in a different situation when, when he's getting targets and he is a part of the offense, something will click back into place and, and he'll start trying. But when I watch OJ Howard, he, he's not tough, he doesn't block, and he's clearly not paying attention to the details of the passing game that are so important for that Tom Brady run offense. And I, I think there's no other way to say it. Uh, he's been a disappointment this year. So OJ Howard is gonna come down three, 77 to a 74 to bring out that Madden rating there and uh, an impending free agent that will be uh, an interesting name, I suppose, to keep an eye on. And now our team analysis going alphabetically here, starting with Da Bears. And Allen Robinson's going to come down. Just a, a disappointing season for him. I think he can get this back, but uh, sounds like COVID hit him pretty hard. I think the fatigue of not having good quarterback play has caught up to him. Uh, still relatively young, I think, brighter days ahead, but did need to come down for a disappointing season. And then really maximizing on Robinson's struggles was Darnell Mooney, fifth round pick, just a really fun prospect coming out, drew some Deontay Johnson comparisons from me, uh, but he doesn't have the drop issues that Deontay has. I don't think he's quite as established as a route runner uh, on all three levels and all that stuff, but he's not far behind. And he became the focal point of this Bears offense. Honestly, if he can just get more established quarterback play, get fields to lock in a little better next year, he, he could really be a breakout candidate next season. He, he definitely impressed with his consistency, and he's got really solid hands. So uh, love me some Darnell Mooney. I get why Bears fans are, are very excited for him. The offensive line wasn't so bad down the stretch. You know, Jason Peters really kind of got in shape and back to form by the end of the year. I'm curious to see what they do there with Jason Peters. He's going to be 40 next year. To count on him to stay at this level is, is difficult, but if... If they feel like he can do it physically, I mean, he he really is a, I don't want to say elite left tackle, but he, he he played at a very high level in the second half of the seasons, which was really impressive. Uh, and then Larry Borum, a lot of you guys uh, remember my draft takes on him as being kind of the, maybe the tackle you want to target third, fourth round, just really smooth footwork and uh, a smooth athlete, had better pass protection technique than I expected. For someone that many considered a raw guy. I thought they got a lot of value in Larry Borum late. He ends up starting a bunch of games at right tackle as Tevin Jenkins. You know, basically a lost season for Jenkins, but Borum is, is intriguing. And I think if you go, if you bring back Peters, Borum, and Jenkins as kind of your three tackles next year, assuming Peters doesn't retire, which is very, very much possible, uh, I, I think you could do a lot worse than those three. Uh, and then over the defensive side of the ball, you're going to see a lot of players dropping down here. It was just a, a disappointing season for the Bears in, in general, in all phases, but a lot of veteran guys here just not playing up to their, 
uh, previous season's pedigree. And, and this is, you know, we saw this in the AFC video. A lot of this week 13 to 18 is finally lowering these veterans that just maybe are on the decline a little bit. Um, but Akeem Hicks, definitely, the, you know, he's had an injury-ridden career. Just wasn't defending the run as well this year, continuing to miss time. He's going to come down. Eddie Goldman was, was kind of checked out this year. He opted out in 2020 and just has not been able to get back to his old form as that uh, high-end run-stuffing nose. Uh, I think on a better defense with more energy, you could see that again in the future. Bilal Nichols, same deal, just not the same discipline up front. And Mario Edwards, who had a really kind of a breakout season in 2020. That D-line in general on the inside was not that stout, sturdy interior that we've seen over the, the kind of Vic Fangio era, I suppose, uh, and beyond his departure, of course. But uh, you get the point. On the edge, however, those guys did step up. Travis Gibson really filled in and, and continued to fill in nicely with Khalil Mack going down for the season. They desperately needed somebody to bring that pocket-pushing power element. He did, and he's a piece for them. Potential full-time starter down the road. And then Robert Quinn, what was it, 18-sack season, looking a little bit like his old self. Now, you got to pump the brakes a little bit. You know, his pressure numbers was still in about his career average, around 50, um, but much better, like, uh, his wins were much more dominant this year, showing the, the classic Robert Quinn cross chop that he's so good at. He's got that bend around the edge. He still has it at his age, and him and him and Gibson were not the issue on this defense when Khalil Mack went down. And then Roquan Smith, who I feel like has just been steadily improving since he came into the league, was a blue chip prospect for me. He's starting to get up into that upper echelon of linebackers. Just super active in coverage, which you like about him. He's improved his tackling and space. Still not a elite run defender, but he's he's getting up there. And I, I know Bears fans were upset. He didn't get all pro mentions. I think he was just a cut below that. I definitely thought about him. But yeah, great season for Roquan. Alex Ogletree going down uh, was a band-aid there that really struggled this year at linebacker. And then Thomas Graham... <laughs> You know, I, I get why the Bears moved off Ryan Pace. He had some big hits and he had some big misses, obviously, with Trubisky and, and some other things. But I liked some of their late round picks this year. Larry Borum and Thomas Graham being really the two guys to highlight there. They, they You know, they've had some guys in the slot, but no one that's I would describe as like a legit starter at slot corner. And when they took Thomas Graham, that's that's what I, I projected him to become for this team. I really did. I mean, he has great man coverage skills. He's tough, he's experienced, really quick guy. And uh, I, I did not think that he belonged going so late. And he's gotten a lot more playing time later in this season in the slot. And it has shown a lot of great flashes. So I would, I would treat him as your starter going into next year and give him that full opportunity to, to reach his potential in the slot. Uh, and then Artie Burns actually kind of like – finally got on the field for the Bears. They signed him last year. He opted out and then didn't really play much earlier on this season, but gets out there in the last four or five weeks of the year, looked like a, a, like a really good number two after he flamed out for the Steelers. But there could be something there with Artie Burns, Thomas Graham, and uh, Jalen Johnson as, as the other corner. You, you could potentially do worse if those guys uh, kind of have a good chemistry and a, and a good build with each other into next season. Dion Bush stepped in, um, you know, him and uh, Carson have, uh, DeAndre Houston Carson have, have been the backups here, but both guys have shown flashes and Dion Bush gets some starts here, continues to build off some of the stuff he's shown as Tayshawn Gibson just is a declining veteran here for the Bears. So a lot of movement for the Bears. It's not all bad because the older guys are going down, but there's some young guys here showing some promise and, and maybe some pieces to build around for a new look defense and a new staff next year. And then on to the Tampa Bay Bucks. So again, we'll be including Wild Card Weekend here, but we got Keyshawn Vaughn, a running back I've been very critical of. Didn't think it was a good third round pick. Probably still wasn't, but as a backup, He's really been flushed into action because if you remember, he's had a hard time getting on the field. He struggled in the receiving game. He hasn't shown much as a runner, but due to injuries, he's had to come out there and, and the receiving stuff still hasn't been there, but he's shown some really nice juice and vision and has provided a spark to that run game off the bench. So getting some love there for Keyshawn Vaughn. 
And then, really, actually, a lot of players going down for this Bucks team. A lot of areas of this team that have disappointed. And I, I talked about OJ Howard, but there's some other young players that are not uh, stepping up, uh, fitting that next man up mentality. Jalen Darden being one of them. A lot of you guys remember how high I was on Jalen Darden. And you got to remember, coming into the year, he was like this team's sixth wide receiver. And I, I do think, I'm not saying it's okay, but I do think Jalen Darden really was like, well, I'm, I'm not really going to see the field anyway. So he's focused on his return duties and running, you know, drills and perfecting his routes and stuff. But when you especially play receiver with Tom Brady, it is all about chemistry and timing and spacing. And that was never Jalen Darden's game coming out of North Texas. He's a good route runner. He's got speed and can get open, but there's not a lot of actual craft to his game and timing to his game. And I, I really think you've seen that missing between him and Brady, not being on the same page, a lack of physicality from him. And uh, it just hasn't worked. Now, in a different situation, I think things could be looking different for Jalen Darden, but he's not a great fit as is right now. Uh, Cyril Grayson, on the other hand, is a smaller guy, but a veteran fighting for his life. He's the guy that has found the spacing out there and uh, has figured things out a little bit more with Tom Brady in this stretch. He's been the guy that stepped up. And then Tyler Johnson, same thing with Jalen Darden. He has not been on the same page with Brady. He's just not always in the right spot. Uh, Brady, again, such a timing player, and Tyler Johnson has let them down. OJ Howard, we talked about him. So these secondary depth pieces for the Bucks really kind of dropping the ball, almost literally. Uh, as far as their ability to step up. And then on defense, they have taken a step down up front. This was such an intimidating front seven last year. It's still very good. Don't get me wrong. And they could, I could very much be jinxing them into lighting it up these next few weeks. But they really haven't been the same, especially from a pass rushing perspective. William Golston and Dominican Sue uh, just getting up there in age. Joe Tryon, who started fast, has disappeared. They, they've tried to get him going, and he, he can't even really pressure the quarterback right now. Jason Pierre-Paul looks, looks older and slower. And then Devin White as well. He's just so undisciplined against the run. You love what he brings as a blitzer. You love his sideline-to-sideline -side speed, and you're always going to get those splash plays from him. Um, but he has not taken any steps up in coverage. He bites the cheese just as much as anybody. And in the run game, you know, just as early as this weekend against the Eagles, like he will give up his gap actually way easier than you would think. So he, he's been a, a disappointment this season. Uh, but Antoine Winfield on the back end continues to ball out. He just, he, he's, he's played straight up slot corner now. Like he just can literally do everything and he does it consistently every single week. Maybe one of the more underrated players in the entire league right now, Antoine Winfield, was an underrated coming out as he fell to the second round. Okay, now we have the uh, Philadelphia Eagles, who took on the Bucks in the wild card round. These two running backs, really fun players. Kenneth Gainwell, a uh, powerful player for such a small back. Very, very reminiscent of Austin Eckler, which was my pro comp for him coming out. And just in the receiving game, he's so smooth. Um, but he, he doesn't see the field a ton because you've got Sanders there. You've got Boston Scott, who's been earning earning reps and playing well. Uh, but KG just passes the eye test, man. He is explosive. And then these receivers, Devontae Smith, if you just watch the L22, this guy's so impressive. His route running, some of the catches he makes, uh, his ability to break tackles after the catch, he, just, he defies physics for what you would think a 175-pound receiver should be able to do. But he's got grip strength at the point of attack um, as a receiver attacking that football. And again, the broken tackles uh, on top of excellent route running and timing and all that stuff. It's just unfortunate that he doesn't have a quarterback that can match uh, his craft in the passing game. Quez Watkins continues to separate and make big catches down the field. He's a player for them as a, as a kind of number three deep threat, I suppose. And then Jalen Rieger, of course, uh, there's been... Plenty of well-earned or well-deserved criticism in the direction of Jalen Rieger. Always going to be in the shadow of Justin Jefferson. Always going to haunt Howie Roseman, who seriously is a GM of the year candidate this year. Uh, but hard to forget what happened with Jalen Rieger, which was, in my opinion, always a horrific draft choice. And then 
Dallas Goddard continues to just be a stable and and the ideal prototype tight end blocks tough dude at the at the catch point he has enough speed to separate over the middle of the field and yeah he's just a really good tight end doesn't get brought up enough as like a top you know obviously not top five but just one of the better tight ends in the NFL and then on this offensive line these guys continue to step up Jordan Maialata at left tackle been such a fun story seriously was in consideration for me for all pro vote he, he's been at that level and it, it's scary to think what he could be in two or three years because of his development track when is it going to stop because it's been on a prolific rate as a guy that was a seventh round pick and, and couldn't block anybody in his first season but with his athletic traits and his size and his work ethic is is he going to be like a hall of fame talent in a couple of years it, it's certainly on the table and i think he knows that so he's really exciting lane johnson of course on the other side uh, second best right tackle in the NFL and just continuing to kick ass uh, having a better season in pass protection this year than he's had in recent years they've got Sua Opita starting at right guard I also saw a rumor that Brandon Brooks is going to be potentially retiring so that that could be a spot that they need to figure out I don't know if Opita is the answer but he's been starting the last few weeks and he's been fine and then Landon Dickerson at left guard has has settled in his pass protection has improved it doesn't seem like Kelsey's going to be going anywhere, so probably sticking with Dickerson at guard, which is just fine. And then over to the defensive side of the ball, Javon Hargrave having an outstanding season as a pass rusher, wreaking havoc up in the middle there. And then on the edge, you've got Teron Jackson, who plays a rotational role for them. Uh, interesting piece for the future, just uh, as a depth piece. Josh Sweat has continued to develop and, and stay their best pass rusher on the edge. Glad to know he's doing okay after a scary situation. He ended up missing the wild card game. And then TJ Edwards. I like TJ Edwards. Really good tackler. Big, bigger linebacker. You don't get a lot of 240 plus pound dudes that can truly run like TJ Edwards can. You know, he's not a Devin White or Micah Parsons or anything, but he's got sideline to sideline speed. And yeah, just a good uh, starting linebacker for them. Something they've been missing. Zach McPherson has been starting getting some uh, rotational reps as well and is fine, I guess. Uh, I don't see a whole lot of upside in, in McPherson, but uh, is not a liability at this point in time. And then the punter and kicker having really good years, Aaron Sippos and Jake Elliott, seriously one of the better kickers in the NFL this season. I, I will talk about Jalen Hurts for just a second because in the weeks 13 through 18, he wasn't terrible. Um, but really bad in the wild card. And I just, I, I talked about him in the podcast yesterday and how he really shouldn't be treated as the future, but he's not going to go down for the wild card game because he, he did have some decent games ahead of that time. And if we were doing this regularly, we probably would have seen like him go up and then go down for the wild card, but just going to stay put for the purposes of this video right here. I uh, just noticed we skipped around alphabetically a little bit, going back to the Cardinals here. And uh, Kyler Murray is going to come down. Just a, a, a rough finish to the season, cooled off, second year in a row where teams have adjusted and he hasn't had as much of a counterpunch. I think a lot of that is Cliff Kingsbury's fault, but obviously a disappointing performance in the wild card. And I think you got to have some pretty serious questions about, you know, his poise as a passer and how sustainable is he going to be as, as an elite quarterback moving forward. He's, he's still a young player. Um, but you, you got to, for what he did in that NFC Championship and, and not playing his best football um, to finish the season, you got to pump the brakes on Kyler Murray a little bit. You just do. And then James Conner had an outstanding season, his highest number of, of broken tackles actually on his career. Remember, he was a monster for Pittsburgh for years, but uh, just a machine in the red zone, really good in the receiving game. I, I think they might extend James Conner, who also is just a great locker room presence to have as well. So uh, good on them to to find him for cheap and get a good good year for him. Him, and then these receivers, Christian Kirk, huge opportunity to really step up and see more targets and help help this offense kind of get that next man up. Uh, with DeAndre Hopkins going down, obviously, and and he wasn't able to do it. He's a slot guy, nothing more, nothing less. Good player, but I just I, I don't see a huge future for Christian Kirk on this team. Because it seems like every time they lean on him to do something big, it just doesn't 
doesn't get there. Like there was the play against the Rams where I felt like he could have made an effort where Kyler was rolling out and he chucked it deep on third down and just kind of hit the turf in between two defenders. Kirk just like either didn't track it or gave up on it, didn't want to get hit. I felt like the effort on that was concerning from Kirk. I, I would need to, go, I guess, go back and rewatch it. But yeah, I just, I don't know. He's fine. Then we got Antoine Wesley, plus five, 64 to a 69. <sighs> Possession guy, big body dude, red zone target. I don't, I don't think there's a whole lot there, but did make some plays uh, in that DeAndre Hopkins frame. And then on the offensive line, these guys did not finish strong. DJ Humphreys kind of goes back to 2019. DJ Humphreys went in 2020. He was he was really dominant. And then Kelvin Beecham, I don't know if it's getting up there in age or he just wasn't quite as good, had a really good season last year, but definitely regressing as a pass protector with that weird six foot three frame. Not a bad player, but definitely a down year compared to last year. And then on the defense, Richard Lawrence, has gotten into the rotation really explosive guy off the ball weird build kind of built like a fridge or a stove but has never been a disciplined run defender going back to his time at lsu but in the time he's gotten for the cardinals he's really been like the only guy up in the middle that's that's kind of held his own and probably need to see a little more richard lawrence based on how bad the rest of these guys are playing Corey peters just, you know, he's like really old. I, I think he's just kind of washed at this point. Byron Murphy is going to come down really solid start to his season. But you look at him in the in the playoffs against in the wild card against the Rams down the stretch for this defense. I, I don't know. I, I don't know if he is a dominant alpha corner. I really I like Byron Murphy. I always have. Um, but he's just missing that extra consistency, missing those dominant traits at the position. Good, quick, smart player. Is he ever going to take that next step? I I don't know at this point. And then Antonio Hamilton, uh, veteran depth piece that was called into action and kind of held his own, but obviously not a very good player. I just want to take a quick second to interrupt the video here and let you guys know I'll be starting up two new rebuilds on my second channel, TFG Plays. So if you enjoy the mad inside of what I do, go check out TFG Plays. I'm going to be starting an offline Giants rebuild like I did with my Bengals rebuild. And I'm also going to be starting up a stream, uh, a live stream series rebuild of a team that I'm currently running a poll on my TFG Plays Twitter for. Uh, the Steelers are currently the lead. I'm kind of hoping uh, some of the other teams pull ahead because that was my last choice, but we'll be doing that actually starting uh, Wednesday. I don't know when this video is going to drop, but go check out TFG Plays. Link in the description down below. And uh, yeah, we'll see you over there. Okay, Dallas Cowboys going to see some falling here as well. Uh, Dak Prescott, similar reasons to Kyler Murray. Just wasn't good down the stretch. The big moments just... The lights can sometimes just feel a little bit too bright for Dak Prescott. It's sometimes it's situational awareness. Sometimes it's playmaking on third down. He's just missing that little extra it factor to be an elite player. He's obviously a very, very good quarterback. Good enough to win a Super Bowl if the rest of his team would have helped him out a little bit more. But down the stretch, Dak Prescott, tons of turnovers. We weren't seeing that same mistake-free elite processing Dak Prescott really from, oh, about week 10 on. And if you take that away, he just doesn't have those high-end physical traits to lean on either. So uh, Dak's going to come down. Zeke's going to come down. I know he played banged up, but I think that's part of it with Ezekiel Elliott at this point. He's got a ton of wear on his tires. And if after five or six weeks, he's going to slow down and look like this. He's no longer an elite running back. Again, he looked really good to start the year, but by the end of the season, he looked sluggish and just not like the old Zeke to the point where you're like, what happened to Zeke? Uh, and then Amari Cooper, honestly kind of disappointed in Amari Cooper's season. A lot of opportunities to take the reins and be a top five receiver. He has all the physical talent in the world, but he was just okay. Obviously not bad, still an 86 rating there, but just kind of lacks that alpha mentality that a lot of receivers have. You know, Justin Jefferson, Jamar Chase, Cooper Cup, Devontae Adams, Tyreek Hill. These guys have that F you mentality, that my ball bitch mentality. Amari Cooper doesn't have that. I think 
Uh, that's maybe what's lacking uh, in Amari Cooper's game. Cedric Wilson was really impressive. He almost became their, their number two receiver over Amari Cooper down the stretch. His run after a catch was really impressive. Dak really started to trust him to go win balls down the field. He separated in the red zone, as a, had a really nice feel for those open spots down in that territory. Uh, an impending free agent, I, I don't know what they're going to do with him and my, Michael Gallup, but definitely impressive season for Cedric Wilson, who could be a nice number two wide receiver for somebody. Dalton Schultz is next up here. He, he's going up again. He's, he's skyrocketed this season. Really nice possession receiver, a good run blocker. He's filled in very nicely as this team's Jason Witten replacement now a couple years later. And then Connor Williams is going to come down. Really disappointing performance against the um, uh, uh, 49ers in the playoffs. Uh, just kind of eye-opening to, to see him get overwhelmed by power uh, in the past pro game where he's been pretty solid all season, uh, but did actually come down towards the end of the year a little bit, and especially in that wild card game. And then Tristan Hill is going to drop down one. He went up one earlier on in the season. This is a former second round pick with a lot of athletic ability, but him and really nobody else on the interior of that defensive line have uh, developed the toughness and discipline that it takes to play run defense. They have a big need for some kind of tone setter, and Tristan Hill, uh, Tristan Hill was not able to do that this year. Um, but they got tone setters on the edge. Dorrance Armstrong has been a great rotational player for them. He's got a little bit of pass rush in there. He is built up and defended the run much better on earlier downs, buying time for these pass rushers. Now, I will say Demarcus Lawrence is going to come down a little bit. Not that he's bad by any stretch of the imagination, um, but I, I came into the year very hot on Demarcus Lawrence. I probably would have said he's a top 10 edge rusher in the league. Uh, I think he just had to come down a little bit. He's still an alpha. He's still fine as a number one guy. But at 88 there, we had him rated as one of the highest in the league. And he just he isn't quite on that level anymore. He hasn't been since that 2000, was that 2019, I, I think it was, when I, I picked him for defensive player of the year. He hasn't quite been on that level, but still a, a hell of a football player. And then in the secondary, Trayvon Diggs going to come up. We've, we've talked uh, at nauseum about the Trayvon Diggs experience. You know, he is a risk taker. He's going to create some big plays in coverage, and, and he's going to create some turnovers because of that. But there are going to be times when you can exploit that. Gave up more yards than any corner in the NFL, and he had more interceptions than any corner in the NFL. Uh, the book is out on Trayvon Diggs. The Niners had read that book and exploited him in the NFC Championship. He is an overrated player, but you can't just straight up say he sucks either. He's, he's a good corner for the Dallas Cowboys. Uh, just... Honestly, sometimes you used a little bit out of um, what he's capable of. Like the, the Cowboys run a lot of cover one. I wouldn't necessarily run a lot of cover one with Trayvon Diggs. I, I think more zone would be fitting for Trayvon uh, as, as opposed to covering Brandon Ayuk on double moves across the middle of the field. But anyway, we've also got Kelvin Joseph, who I would like to see more Kelvin Joseph in the wild card game based on how well he played finally getting on the field late this season. Uh, this is a really athletically gifted corner out of Kentucky, a young player they drafted in the second round. And he, again, really high upside player, showed some really nice flashes in a, in a couple looks as the season went on there. And I think heading into next year, they have expectations for him to emerge as a full-time starter next to Trayvon Diggs there. And then that could be a nice compliment if Kelvin Joseph becomes more of your cover corner that you can put on a guy like Ayuk, whereas Trayvon Diggs is more of that tough, tone-setting playmaker type. That could actually be a really nasty duo uh, if they continue to develop properly together. Uh, and then Greg the Leg has regressed. His accuracy has, has been a problem for the Cowboys in, in spurts throughout the season. Uh, but their punter, Brian Anger, the guy the Jags took way back when, the pick before Russell Wilson, uh, is on the Cowboys now and actually was one of the better punters in the league this season per average. All right, the Atlanta Falcons, the quarter L Patterson experience did cool off. We kind of had a feeling that was going to happen. We asked questions about that when he was star of the week, I think multiple times. But yeah, the running efficiency did cool down. I, I'm still impressed by what he's able to do as a running back, as a receiver hybrid type. Um, but obviously was a little bit of a flash in the pan for a little bit there. Uh, curious to see what kind of contract he earns and if it's from Atlanta or San Francisco or who's going to be interested in 
the flex weapon in Corderell. Great kick returner as well. Uh, Keith Smith has been a great fullback for them, helping out in the run game, paving the way for Corderell. And then Russell Gage did step up with, with uh, Ridley uh, in his off the field um, issues right now. They needed Gage to step up. And especially as the, the season went on, he showed that he can be at least a really good number two for this team. Kyle Pitts became more consistent as the season went on as well. It, it felt like only a matter of time with Kyle Pitts. You wish he scored more touchdowns, but honestly, I put that on Matt Ryan, who's always been a tragedy in the red zone, not on Kyle Pitts, who showed two years at Florida of being maybe the most dominant red zone weapon in college football history. I don't know. Uh, he's up there. Uh, and then on the offensive line, some movement, Caleb McGarry, really impressing as a run blocker this season. I mean, the run blocking up front was not bad for the Atlanta Falcons this year, a big part of why Corderella had such a great year. But Matt Hennessy, a, sh a throwback to my breakout players list, loved their process with Matt Hennessy. Perfect combination of scheme with that outside zone running fit. His ability as a quick, smaller center who's really good at uh, getting to space in the, the outside zone stretch run game. And he thrived as a run blocker, especially in the second half of this season. They've found their center. He needs to improve in pass protection dramatically. But uh, what, what a fit Matt Hennessy is. Jake Matthews, on the other hand, uh, had probably his worst season in, in a while here for the for the Falcons. Uh, just a slight tick down for him. And then over to the defensive side of the ball, Grady Jarrett, really disappointing season. Just like 35 pressures, one sack. Now you look at the guys around him and it is an actual joke. Like you could triple team Grady Jarrett and you still wouldn't feel any pass rush. So I still think he's a hell of a football player and I think he drew a ton of attention this year but uh, it's still concerning um, based on how highly we had him rated and how low his production was. He, he also had his worst season uh, as far as run defense grade goes. Um, Mike Pinnell, just getting up there in age. They wanted a physical presence there. He didn't bring it. These two edge guys, James Vodders, who, who flashed early this season and then completely disappeared. Brandon Copeland, they just don't have answers on the edge. They really don't. They got to figure that position group out next year, or it's going to be more of the same for this defense. Um, but Deion Jones as well, not um, answering anything at linebacker for them. It, it It's really starting to feel like his 2016, 2017 performances were almost like a flash in the pan because he's been a below average linebacker in several years leading up to this year. And this year, he's genuinely been one of the worst in the league. Uh, just a complete liability in the run game, and he's not making plays in coverage. They're paying him a ton of money to be one of the worst linebackers in the league right now. Uh, he's got a very nice pedigree. He was, at a time, a top five linebacker, but it has completely flipped the script, and he is a concern right now on this defense. Michael Walker, on the other hand, has, has been their best linebacker. Now, they don't play him a ton because you got Deion Jones. You're paying a ton of money. You got... Um, Oh, the, the Harvard kid, who's pretty good. But uh, Michael Walker, when he gets out there, he's their best tackler. He doesn't get out of position. He's a, a solid run defender. He's the bigger. Uh, Foya said Aluakun is the other linebacker. Um, but Walker is the only one over 225 pounds who can thump a little bit. And uh, they might be better suited to move a Deion Jones and, and start Michael Walker, who looks like he can play. And then A.J. Terrell, seriously... Uh, maybe the best corner in the NFL this year, not named Jalen Ramsey that nobody was aware of. You know, the real like football Twitter heads were, were aware of what AJ Terrell was doing, but his numbers are off the charts. When you look at his ability to play lockdown coverage, not give up catches, his press is, is phenomenal. He's got deep speed to defend the deep ball. Uh, he's tough on like in, in breakers and stuff. I was so overwhelmingly impressed by AJ Terrell this season. I think I picked him for first team all pro and for him to do that on such a bad defense was remarkable. So uh, AJ Terrell plus one, what a season for him. And then Young Hoku continues to be just one of the more accurate, consistent kickers in the entire league. Next up, we've got the Washington football team. Uh, not a ton of players moving here. It's kind of a rough finish for their season, but Jarrett Patterson, the Mem um, not Memphis, the Buffalo contact balance back 
comes in here and, and breaks some tackles, shows some flashes. John Bates finished really strong. Mid-round pick out of uh, Boise State. Was a really good run blocker for, for them, which is something he, he didn't necessarily show it at Boise. He seems to have uh, sturdied up in that department. And uh, his his hands were, were never a question. He's got good hands. So he's a good possession tight end with some good blocking ability. And then Sadiq Charles has started some games here. Tackle, guard, uh, just another offensive lineman that Washington has turned into a solid player. Um, he was a really athletic, raw-ass dude coming out of LSU and, and clearly has been working at his craft. He's got some potential there. And uh, it doesn't have to start but there's, there's room for him to become a full-time starter for Washington for sure. And then on the defensive side of the ball, just some role players here. You got James Smith-Williams has had to be a full-time starter with those injuries to um, Young and Montez Sweat. And he's been a, a good run defender. He's done some things as a pass rusher. He just he doesn't have that athletic upside, but he can be a nice complement and, and already is too young and sweat when those guys come back as an early down run defender that can keep those guys fresh. And then Danny Johnson, one of my like very, very early late round like scouting pops. Uh, just when I watched him back when I was just doing like highlight reel scouting, you know, 2016, when I was just getting into the draft, I was like, dang, this guy really flies around and makes plays and uh, is fun in the slot but uh, has never really gotten those opportunities. And, and he's, uh, you know, he's got speed. He ran in the four fours and finally kind of fighting his way up and, and showing that same scrappiness that I remember from him coming out. Uh, fun to see him get on the field. There's not a ton of opportunities for him, uh, but could have a chance at that starting slot job as we look into next season. Someone to keep an eye on. Now the San Francisco 49ers. I'm going to raise Jimmy Garoppolo. I think his stretch of football was actually really good. We've kind of beaten his two weaknesses to death at this point. We know he's got his um, glaring warts as a quarterback, but he does a lot of really nice stuff as well. Uh, so he, he, you know, he's going to be a nice addition for somebody next year, I think. Uh, look at like Washington, Pittsburgh, especially as a team that I, I think could be a legit like playoff contender with with Jimmy Garoppolo next year. Not not what they were this year with Big Ben. Uh, then we got Elijah Mitchell impressive just sturdy back he's beaten out Trey Sermon entirely he's, he's the guy he's got better vision frankly he's got better speed to the edge he is a really good blocker is I think how he initially impressed Shanahan over Trey Sermon um, they do all this stuff with Debo and actually Elijah Mitchell a lot of times has to be the lead blocker and he's really good at it so versatile running back and then Debo of course going up now it's worth noting here if, because these are Madden ratings, right? There's there's certain players that I will point out that the Madden rating doesn't do my opinion of that player justice because you've got certain ratings and a formula to worry about and stuff. It's it's a good way to show my perception of these players, but it's not perfect. And sometimes I need to point this out when it, it doesn't necessarily sync up. I would rather Debo be a 90 overall. But with Madden, it, you know, his route running isn't, elite it's good but he's i wouldn't even say it's very good he's got solid route running he's a good receiver and his hands actually are not anything spectacular he's dropped a lot of balls he will win contested catches i wouldn't describe him as elite in that department like he's a very good receiver he's an 84 in that regard but his impact on this team well surpasses what a madden rating can capture and Speaking of Madden, if you switched him to running back, he would be a 94 uh, because his ability with the ball in his hands is unlike most things we've ever seen at the receiver position. Literally just sticking him in at running back and him looking like one of the best running backs in the NFL. So had to get that out of the way because, you know, Madden doesn't count you know, break tackle and juke and all that stuff. They don't contribute that to the formula the same way we maybe perceive Debo Samuel. But this guy scores a touchdown every week and every single time it feels like it's at the right when they need it. He makes that big play. He's a terrifying weapon for this team and he is so valuable. So I understand you see that 84 and you're like, that's way too low for Debo. But I had to explain why it comes in at that number. And then Brandon Ayuk, gosh, his emergence for this team 
was so meaningful. I, I mean, a lot of guys stepped up in the second half of this year, but they needed a route runner, just as we saw against the Cowboys. I mean, they might not win that game. Well, they would probably still win that game without Ayuk, but God, he was, he was a difference maker. Uh, and, you know, Jimmy Garoppolo missed him on what should have been a, a game-ending touchdown to, to Ayuk on a double move where he beat Trayvon Diggs. But, you know, he's got the route running. He's the guy that can beat press, and he is good with the ball in his hands, but he's a great compliment to Debo Samuel. Uh, these guys have similarities, but they... You know they complement each other well as well because I, I don't think Samuel is the same ability in press and uh, route running, but Ayuk's not quite the same as far as that run after catch uh, physical element that Debo brings. And then Juwan Jennings is again like the perfect third guy for them because uh, he's just kind of a third down target. He's a possession guy. He's really slow for a wide receiver, but he blocks his absolute ass off. He's kind of this team's poor man's Cooper Cup is the way they use Jawan Jennings. He's, he's been a nice weapon for them. George Kittle, his run blocking is just getting better and better and better, it feels like. And he, he the thing you love about George Kittle is I don't think he minds that he, he doesn't get catches all the time. Certain game plans, it's all about him springing things open for these other weapons because he is that good as a blocker. But so many times in this week 13 on stretch, they leaned on George Kittle as a receiver, and he, sh when they did that, he reminded you how good he is in that regard. Uh, not just like run after catch where he's spectacular, not just the speed to run away from guys over the middle of the field, but like making spectacular grabs in big moments. This guy's one of the best players in football, period. And then Charlie Warner as the second tight end has been blocking really well for them. And then on the offensive line, you got to be impressed by what Tom Compton has done, a career guard coming in and just mauling guys in the run game. A bit of a liability in pass protection, but when they're just lining him up, so go beat up the guy in front of you, that tough uh, Dakota, what is he, South Dakota State, North Dakota State, one of those, uh, just beat up this dude in front of you, get off the ball. Uh, been a, a great run blocker for them up front. And then on the defense, uh, go back and listen to kind of what I talked about these guys, um, the way they rotate, all of these different rotational pieces, um, getting after the passer, playing tough run defense, Contravious Street, Kevin Givens, DJ Jones, Charles Amenihu, Arden Key, Samson Abukum, all these guys move in and out of the lineup and in and out of the formations. Some will play three tech, five tech, all over the place. They slant them. They just, all of them, they all stand out in different ways and have been really impressive. Arden Key, I think, and, and Charles Amenehu are the interesting pieces there because Amenehu was kind of freed from Houston for a mid-round pick. He was like one of the defensive players that showed legitimate flash coming into the year. And yeah, he's just an athletically gifted big guy with with uh, some, some future here for San Francisco. And same thing with Arden Key in, in a lot of ways where he was a former five-star, never really showed that development ability until he got here to San Francisco where now he's got like an eight sack season, 40 pressures, he's beefed up, he's playing more physical. Between those two and Nick Bosa, I, and of course you got Eric Armstead, Eric Armstead, you know, I think you're in a good place to move on from like DJ Jones and and compensate for the fact that Javon Kinlaw hasn't been this guy. But imagine if Javon Kinlaw comes back next year and gets in the mix with all these guys and starts to play with that tenacity, then you get really scared. But an impressive front four from the Niners and what they've done for this defense. And then the, the defensive backs, and you know, kind of almost legendary at this point in my playoff predictions show, I said the Niners don't have anyone in their secondary other than Ambry Thomas, who's playing well. Uh, oversight on my end. I, I thought Emmanuel Mosley was done for the year, uh, but he had come back and he's playing well. He's a good veteran, uh, just solid starter. I don't think he's a superstar, but he's definitely a good player. And Ambry Thomas has been balling out. I mean, he held his own against CD and Cooper He's been making game-winning interceptions, and I, I loved Ambry Thomas coming out. Uh, his man coverage ability was some of the best in the class, and his press ability. Uh, not a lot of corners are genuinely comfortable playing with their, their back turned to the quarterback um, in man coverage, and Ambry Thomas was one of them. He had a really impressive senior bowl. His tape was good. I love this pick by the Niners, and for him to be 
really playing well late uh, in his rookie season screams to me that that he's going to be a starter in this league for a long time. And I've been really impressed by Ambry Thomas. After a, after a pretty rough start for, for Thomas, I think we lowered him earlier in this series. All right, the New Orleans Saints, not going to harp on this offense too much. It's just been really hard for them with with the quarterback situation they've been dealing with, with the injuries they've been dealing with, and, and the receiver. Like, they just don't have talent right now on that side of the ball. Marquez Callaway has stepped up. Um, interesting player. Could be a, a number two option to Michael Thomas when he comes back. But yeah, he, he had a nice year. On the offensive line, though, Calvin Throckmorton had to start. I think it was Andrews Pete that went down for the year. God, he was really bad. Just a turnstile of an offensive lineman, which, you know, I, I don't know if it's just bad luck playing left guard for the Saints or what, but when Andrews Pete leaves and things get worse, that's it's not a good sign. So Calvin Throckmorton's coming down. But this defense kept this season alive, man. This defense was really fun to watch. You got to credit these guys up front. Uh, the toughness they play was Shy Tuttle, under the radar player, really nasty run defender up front. Christian Ringo, uh, to making the most of his opportunities that he's gotten with this team of veteran defensive tackle. Both guys really in run defense standing out. And then Marcus Davenport, second he came back from injury, this defense came alive. I mean, he he, he had a different imita uh, intimidation factor as a power rusher to just run guys over. And he's he's got a very bright future as they kind of phase out um, Cam Jordan. I think they will pay Mar Marcus Davenport when the time comes. And then uh, Caden Ellis as kind of a hybrid linebacker, him and and um, Zach Bond kind of both doing okay. I like Zach Bond as well, but Caden Ellis kind of fought, fought for reps, bigger linebacker that can do some pass rushing on the on the line of scrimmage work in those four three odd packages that they run. Uh, just a rotational piece that that caught my attention, and then. In the secondary, another third-round corner that I loved, Paulson Adebo. So both Ambry Thomas and Adebo, I, I thought this was an underratedly deep corner class with guys like Adebo and Ambry Thomas standing out. And my God, both those guys balled out uh, in the last quarter of this season. Paulson Adebo especially, man, um, he's, a, he's a rock star. I mean, this, this Saints secondary in general are really good. But Adebo, who just, you know... He, he had this weird Stanford career where he dealt with an injury and he dealt with, I think, what, an opt-out his final year or something, um, but just didn't have a lot of tape. But when he was out there, like, he was a first-round corner with really good athletic traits. I couldn't believe the Saints got him in the third round. In fact, I, I was so high on him, I said, if you just flip, I, I hated the, the Peyton Turner pick. I said, if you just flipped Paulson Adebo and Peyton Turner, I would have given their draft a much better grade than if they did it the way they did it. Um, but yeah, he, he's a baller, man. He's been a big part of this lockdown man coverage ability paired with Chauncey Gardner-Johnson as their nickel corner. Um, you've got Darby and, or Roby, sorry, and uh, Marshawn Lattimore. They are four deep at corner and they come up and play physical press man coverage unlike anybody in the league can do right now. Uh, and those two guys right there, Adebo and Johnson, are, are big factors in that. And then P.J. Williams also has been kind of the third safety. Uh, you know, it's kind of hard to say for sure between P.J. and C.J. You know, who's the slot corner? Who's the free safety? They, they move these guys around well. Uh, well, we know Gardner Johnson's not the free safety, but um, he's also kind of a safety corner hybrid piece. They, they move these guys around. But P.J. Williams has been their, you know, dime back, and he's he's been very good for them making plays in the secondary and then their young punter Blake Gillikin had a good year kicking the football off all right New York Giants this is going to be a sad one most of it is players going down um, but there are some young players here to be excited about but the the big names of this offense tragic season Saquon Barkley this one hurts you know I, I've got a, a Saquon poster on my wall he's the best you know highest grade I've ever given to a prospect Huge Saquon Barkley fan over here, but it's it's just ugly, man. He he's not breaking tackles like he used to. He's he still shows the juice, but it's not the same. Like Saquon, two or three years ago, when he first came into the league, you watched him. It was like I've never seen someone move like that before, and you just you don't feel that way about Saquon anymore. I don't know if it's the injuries, 
the fatigue of just running into brick walls for three years, but I really hope that this is just his low point and he can get back, but it's reached the point now where it's not just his blocking um, cause, because his, his missed tackle rate is down and he is, he's dancing around in the backfield when he doesn't need to. It's, it's just ugly. Kenny Galladay, talk about ugly. One of the worst free agent signings in recent memory. Um, they give him a ton of money. He catches 500 yards and no touchdowns. Like, what the hell? I, I, I almost don't even feel like talking about this. Like, Giants fans, I don't even know if they're listening to this because they're so deflated by what they saw. Um, but I guess this stuff needs to be said. Uh, Darius Slayton disappointed this year after showing flashes as a young player. Just no consistency there from Darius Slayton this year. Evan Ingram, it's just, it's just sad. Like, dude, freaking block somebody. He's so useless as a tight end. He's okay as a big slot, but then he drops the ball too. I, I do get frustrated when a player like Evan Ingram has this much physical ability and he's done nothing but regress since he's come into the league. Um, but... Andrew Thomas, someone wants to work their ass off here, and it's Andrew Thomas. And I'm glad because he was my number one tackle in a class that had Tristan Wirfs in it. But I think at this point, obviously Wirfs is Wirfs. But at this point, I and I, I think I had Wirfs second. I would have to revisit that, but I'm pretty sure I had Wirfs second. I had Thomas one. I think at this point, I feel pretty good saying that I'd rather have Thomas over um, Becton, over... Um, uh, oh gosh, uh, Wills for Cleveland. Th those guys are good. Those guys are really good. And then, yeah, those four, right? So I, I feel pretty good about Thomas as like a franchise left tackle for the Giants. The way he moved, I thought was underrated. He's a good run blocker, get off off the ball. The only thing was like he needed to improve his kick slide ability and getting NFL coaching, even if it's from the freaking New York Giants, he is locked in as a pass protector. So at least the Giants have what looks like a franchise left tackle who's a really hard worker and hopefully only going to get better here as long as the Giants don't screw him up too. And then Nate Solder getting up there in age, just getting worse and worse and worse. Will Hernandez is a surprising disappointment as far as the way he's regressed. He looked like a really promising young guard with a lot of uh, power as a run blocker, but he's just been a liability for them for two years now. He's he's kind of like done as a starter at this point. And then Matt Skura, that's been a disaster. Um, he had like one good year, and then all of a sudden he forgot how to pass block. I don't know what that's all about, but he has fallen from the face of the earth. I think he was like a 72 originally, so he's lost 11 on the season. He's been that bad. <sighs> Okay, we got through it. We're done talking about the Giants offense, which is clearly just the hardest thing to talk about because it's that bad. Um, onto the defense, not quite as bad. Danny Shelton, veteran nose tackle, um, just didn't have that physical presence up front. And then Aziz Ajilari. I, I guess if, as long as the Giants keep drafting out of Georgia, they'll be just fine, apparently. Um, Aziz in the second round after they traded down was a really good move by Dave Gettleman. I mean, he's had first round production for an edge player. He's got 10 sacks, over 40 pressures. He's done it defending the run, dropping into coverage. He's shown pass rush moves. I, I'm impressed by Aziz Ajilari, who was kind of a first, second round consideration. They get him in the mid to, eight, uh, mid to late second. Really good move for them. And he's a piece for them as a pass rusher. And then this Jaron Williams cat. I don't know much about him, but he's been out there uh, kind of getting rotational defensive back reps, which is impressive. It's a deep secondary for him to even get out there shows uh, that the coaches are really impressed by, by his ability in practice. And he's made some plays in the ball. So I guess keep an eye on Jaron Williams and that secondary that's really deep. And then the Detroit Lions, none other than Amon Ross St. Brown, who, who certainly could have been a star of the week uh, candidate. He really turned into the Lions offense from the slot, crossing routes, deep cross, shallow cross, run after catchability, tough dude. Uh, you know, he is, I think, 
a premium slot receiver at this point. I mean, he was really impressive with his route running and, and grit in that part of the field. Not someone you want to count on to be your number one wide receiver or anything like that. He just doesn't have the speed and the release on the outside. But, you know, you've got your sort of, um, I don't want to say Cooper Cup, but your Hunter Renfro. Your, your slot receivers are really important. They've found theirs. Uh, so he's a weapon for them moving forward. Brock Wright has gotten some looks at tight end, whatever. Athletic guy out of Notre Dame. So keep an eye on him, I suppose. You know, he's shown some flashes. Anytime an, uh, Dan Campbell gets his hands on an athletic tight end, it usually ends well. So I suppose keep an eye on Brock Wright next to TJ Hawkinson there. And then on the old line, this group's impressive. Penny Sewell, Jonah Jackson, two young guys just mauling dudes in the run game. Uh, they are building blocks for the O line. And even Hal Vitae at guard, I he's overpaid, but you can do worse than Vitae at right guard. Um, but they might not need to start him if they prefer Evan Brown next year. Because remember, they're going to get uh, ooh, Frank Ragnow back at center, who's one of the best centers in the league. And Evan Brown replaced him valiantly, developed his pass protection as the year went on, and is a nasty guy off the line of scrimmage. He's shorter, but really strong. And, you know, he could be a guard for them if they if they find a way to move on from Vitae, who is really expensive. I don't know what their cap hit and stuff would be there, but they've, they've got a really nice offensive line. And Taylor Decker came back and played really well as well. So uh, they are well-rounded on this old line. Then for the defense, Michael Brockers. Um, you know, I wonder if it's just age regression because pretty much everybody played physical on this team. And Michael Brockers had by far his worst season, not just in run defense where he was getting moved all over the place, but Brockers had just six pressures on like 300 something pass rush snaps. Like he was a complete Teletubby in the middle of this D line next to Levi and Wuzurike. Now Lions fans, I, I tweeted about on Wuzurike a couple days ago when I was, you know, looking into this and, you know, I guess he played hurt and all this stuff playing from the opt-out last year. I get it, but he was he was so, so bad. <laughs> um, PFF run defense grade of like 39, which is about as low as you'll see for a, a defensive tackle. It basically means that he's always getting moved off his spot. And uh, just three pressures on 180 pass rush snaps. No sacks. Um, just not getting after the quarterback at all so second round pick undersized guy out of Washington who opted out this could just be a bust or or he uh was injured needs a year to gain weight and get up to speed uh, I trust this Lions staff to figure it out with him but god this is one of the more concerning starts for a uh a young defensive lineman. And, and, you know, between Tillery and Kinlaw, it's becoming harder and harder, I feel like, to find physical, uh, tough defensive tackles these days. So it's just something to keep in mind. Uh, maybe the value of that position is going up a little bit. Uh, just something to think about as we move forward, as it's becoming even more of a, you know, a lot of teams like to run the ball, you know. It's, it's hard to find guys that'll get nasty up front sometimes. Okay, uh, on the edge though, that's not the problem for Detroit. You've got Julian Aquara continuing to grow as a versatile edge piece, a little finesse rush, got a little bit of power, good coverage ability. He's been a good run defender. Charles Harris, former first round pick, has burst onto the scene for Detroit. I'm curious to see what they do with him. Um, former first rounders can often get paid surprising amounts of money. So I'm curious, like, does a team fall in love with what they saw from him? He was impressive. He, he had a, you know, did he reach double-digit sacks? I know he had over 40 pressures. He had, he had a very good season for Detroit. And, you know, they're sitting there with that number two pick. They have edge rushers on this roster. They might be drafting one with Thibodeau or uh, Hutchinson. So I, I don't know what they'll do with him. But he's shown enough to be viewed as a starter heading into next year. He really has. And then in the secondary, a lot of young players getting some playing time here. So Afetu Melifanwu, 
big, stiff corner. I'm not a big Melifanu fan, but got in some rotations and didn't get exposed. AJ Parker, their slot corner, he's really bad in coverage. I, I know Lions fans like him. He's tough. He fought for this job, but really got attacked in coverage and was just a physical run defender in that position. Maybe a move to safety could be good for him, but yeah, he's not a good cover corner, but with that playing time, the experience, the run defense, we're going to give him some respect there. And then Monty Oruwariye had his best season this year. Uh, can do a little bit of everything at corner. He's got size. Uh, he's a starter for them. And I, I don't remember if his contract's up this year or next year, but he he deserves to be paid uh, a solid chunk of change. And then Dean Marlowe tackled well as a veteran safety, whatever. And then Jack Fox is actually going to come down. The beloved Lions punter who was like, you know, one of the good, one lone good things they had going for them last year. Not, uh, not as consistent this year as far as his placement and stuff. So on to the Green Bay Packers inside the NFC North still. Aaron Rodgers just on a run is going to go up one, just playing like a total surgeon right now, looking like he's going to win his second MVP in a row. Uh, Patrick Taylor Jr. getting some looks in that Detroit game, especially with the starters getting pulled in the second half. And, you know, he looked kind of A.J. Dillon light. Big dude, played with some toughness. Actually, was really impressive. So he gets created as the third string there. Actually wasn't in Madden, so I had to make him. And then, uh, just a, a mention on Patrick Taylor, another Memphis running back. Like, these guys are just an absolute factory. You've got Pollard... Uh, Daryl Henderson, uh, the uh, Kenneth Gainwell, Patrick Taylor. They, they're just producing NFL running backs like nobody's business. Uh, Devontae Adams going to join the 99 club, another star of the week candidate. He has taken a next step. Uh, coming into the year, I said either him or Tyree Kill are the best, most valuable receiver, but I actually said Tyree Kill is the most valuable receiver. And I would not say that anymore. I think Devontae Adams has surpassed anything Tyree Kill's speed can offer. His, his ability to all three levels, short, intermediate, deep, is elite. His route running at all three levels is elite. He has uh, the best release off the line of scrimmage ever other than maybe Chad Ochocinco. He has established outstanding ball skills he's winning contested catches that he hasn't over uh over his career solid hands like he is unbelievable and deserves to be in the 99 club at this point then alan lazard credit where credit's due i was very hard on alan lazard basically called him a waste of space a big bodied receiver who doesn't separate and has bad ball skills there's no business for a player like that in the nfl but in this stretch of time, weeks 13 to 18, made a lot of tough catches. Was even creating a little separation. And as of this point in time, it looks like a option, a number two option for this passing game. Someone you have to account for at least a little bit. And uh, obviously is a good chemistry with Aaron Rodgers. Uh, now that I said that, he's going to have three drops and the Packers are going to lose to the Niners. So I'm sorry, Packers fans. Um... Josiah DeGuara had a big catch and run against Detroit. He's actually been blocking better lately. Also some really frustrating drops. It was a waste of a pick in the third round, but he's doing some nice stuff for this team. Uh, Yasua uh, Nishman is a player to keep an eye on at this point. I mean, he played very well at left tackle. Like better, I, I would say he was an average left tackle this year, like right around that 16 to 20 range for when he was in there. And, uh, you know, for a guy that's 6'7", really good athletic testing numbers. This guy came before uh, Christian Derrissaw at Virginia Tech. I don't know if he played right or left at Virginia Tech, but with his athletic ability, the way he's developed, I mean, credit to Green Bay for finding him. But is this someone that could be like a right tackle of the future for this team? I don't know. He's very intriguing. He's 6'7". He's got length. He's athletic. He's developed nicely. I'm very intrigued by Nijman, uh, who looks like he's going to take a seat for the playoffs here, but, you know, still young. And then Royce Newman at right guard. <sighs> a lot of ups and downs in pass pro, but he is really tough as a run blocker. He's, a, I think, just going to be a nice um, kind of like swing man for them. 
He's a guy that played tackle at Ole Miss. I, I just don't see him ever becoming the pass protector to be reliable enough for them. But he's only a rookie. Uh, but he's going to be taking a seat in the playoffs. And uh, John Runyon, actually at left guard, has been the, the most stable lineman that they've had. Uh, he's played every game. He's been a great pass protector. He's really tough in run, run block. And then Lucas Patrick is going to move over to right guard with uh, all these different moving pieces here with, with Myers and um, David Bakhtiari coming back. But Patrick played really well at center. A uh, guy from Duke, smart guy. He's developed nicely for Green Bay. And he'll be uh, testing his luck at right guard moving forward. But the O-line has done a nice job for being such a makeshift group this year for Green Bay. Then over to the defense, Dean Lowry's actually had a nice year as a power rusher in the middle, over 40 pressures this year. Uh, they're paying him a, a decent chunk of change to do that, so it's been good to see that. Rashawn Gary, uh, how many Rashawn Gary tweets do I have this year? I mean, stop sleeping on the guy. And maybe I am at this point with 85 uh, is he a one-dimensional pass rusher? Yes, absolutely. But that one dimension is about as hard to block as any anything else other pass rushers may have other than like Miles Garrett and Aaron Donald and what they can do. But I mean, seriously, his, his power rush, his ability to push the pocket and uh, obviously, you know, speed up the, the quarterback's release and, and processing is, is valuable. But when he doesn't get home, a lot of times other guys get home and he flushes the quarterback out of the pocket. And I think Preston Smith has benefited from that. And now you're going to be adding Zadarius Smith to the mix here. It's, it's crazy. But, you know, Preston Smith, the last, he statistically speaking, was the best pass rusher in the NFL for like a four week stretch. Uh, I can't remember when it started. I know the Baltimore game was in the middle of it or at the end of it, but in this week 13 to 18, he, he had four games where he had 32 pressures and like six sacks. I mean, that's on pace for the best pass rush season ever. Now, he's not that good. I'm just saying he was unbelievable uh, in this time. And, and the Packers better hope they can get that from him uh, for a Super Bowl push. And then uh, Tipa Galay kind of stepped in as that hybrid early down uh, edge player to to give Gary and Preston Smith some some reps on the gas mask to catch their breath. And then Devondre Campbell, first team all pro season just out of nowhere. You know, talk about most improved player of the year. That's got to be him right there. You know, Campbell's always actually been a phenomenal tackler with, you know, six foot four, long arms, moves well in space. He's always had that to his game. But in this scheme, he's just been comfortable. He, he, they don't ask him to do t a ton in coverage, but what they ask is simple in short zones and manning running backs up out of the backfield, spying the quarterback. It's simple stuff, and he really has handled it well and let his athleticism do the, do the talking. And, yeah, I mean, well-deserving first-team All-Pro season for Devondre Campbell. And a tip of the cap to Brian Gutekunst for finding him. And for finding these next two guys, Eric Stokes, I was critical of that draft pick. I was wrong. I, I think at this point, you'd be pretty stupid to say you'd rather have Asante Samuel than Eric Stokes, which I thought was a no-brainer. So, you know, for all the times to talk about my good draft takes, I, Eric Stokes is better better corner right away, and I, I missed on that. Um, I like Stokes, but not, not as much as I like Samuel. And then for them to find Rasul Douglas and him to be changing games with his late-game interceptions... Um, I don't know how sustainable Rasul Douglas' success is, because uh, he's success is. I don't know why that sounded so weird, but um, just a smart player. He's really good in zone. He's a perfect scheme fit. Uh, no reason to think he can't stay as a good number two corner, other than I guess that he hasn't been that throughout his career. But yeah, Stokes and Douglas, Campbell, all these pickups have been game changers for this defense. And then uh, Mason Crosby's going to come down. God, um, it is kind of scary. Uh, for Packers fans, like, is Mason Crosby going to cost them a, a playoff game with all the missed kicks this year? Certainly possible. He's been one of the worst kickers in the NFL this year. He's, he's been missing a lot. Okay, we got the Carolina Panthers, both quarterbacks. Um, you know, Cam Darnold and Sam Newton. <laughs> it, doesn't, it hasn't mattered. <laughs> These guys just have been a disaster. <laughs> uh, turnover machines, missing throws, missing reads. It, it's been so bad, the quarterback situation in Carolina. Uh, I'm kind of done with both these guys, honestly. I'm definitely done with Cam. Sam Darnold, I just, he's in the Drew Locke category where it's like he's got to be a backup. If he gets opportunities and, and 
looks good with those opportunities. Maybe you can entertain uh, a, a career revival, but he is a backup quarterback at this point. And then Terrace Marshall coming down two, and you know I, I'm not terribly surprised that he's had a rough rookie season. I thought he was incredibly raw. I was a little bit lower on him. I did like him, but I actually said in my Panthers deep dive that I wouldn't be surprised if Shai Smith outproduced Terrace Marshall in his rookie season because he is so raw. And with DJ Moore and Robbie Anderson, there's not an easy. Um, answer for where Terrace Marshall should play because I don't think he's a slot guy. I think he's a perimeter player. Um, he hasn't had the quarterback play to help him as a deep threat. So it's really not on Terrace Marshall. And I think he's still got a bright future ahead, but he's got to come down. He has been bad when he's been on the field. So it's a, it's a pump the brakes moment with Terrace Marshall. I think he'll be just fine. Second round pick with a lot of athletic potential. And LSU, of course, has been a factory four receivers, but uh, he's got to come down. DJ Moore's got to come down. He has yet to fix his drop issues, which is just becoming more and more concerning. Uh, still a physical freak and a great receiver, but uh, you know there was some games in there where you're like, ah, gosh, DJ, that was disappointing that you didn't come down with that ball. And then um, on the O-line, Brady Christensen settled in at left tackle. Nice third round pick, athletic guy. Uh, can get overwhelmed by power, but uh, I I think he's probably their left tackle next year. They just have too many other issues to worry about, especially on the interior of the offensive line. I don't know if he's the long-term answer, but it did always feel like he was a good Band-Aid pick, and, and he's been fine at left tackle. On the inside, though, Dennis Daly has not been fine. The other guys they've been playing have also been a disaster. Uh, but yeah, Daly's got to be a backup next year you can't roll in it in the next year with him as a starter and then on the defense Derek Brown has actually been I would just say a little bit disappointing not that he's been bad he's been a solid starter for them but you know I think that at that 79 mark you were expecting him to kind of hit the ground running in year two and and really emerge as like a dominant run defender someone that can rush the passer at a, at a pretty high level it's a guy that, you know, he's, he's been compared to like Akeem Hicks and Kenny Clark, and he's been nowhere near that level. He's been a solid starter, but yeah, just not taking that next step in year two has been disappointing for Derek Brown. Morgan Fox, a free agent signing for them, kind of that hybrid pass rushing specialist. Um, he, had a, he had a good start. He really did, but he, he's been just lackluster to say the least out there, not getting after the quarterback. I don't know if he stopped giving a shit or what, but uh, it's been it's been ugly for Morgan Fox lately. And then Marquise Haynes has capitalized on the, on him on Morgan Fox not playing as well. I mean, he's looked really good compared to Fox, an interesting player, that kind of five star SEC pedigree who just kind of came into the league, kind of underdeveloped, and um, has put the pedal to the metal lately. He's getting after the quarterback. He's defending the run well, and I think he should be their third guy with Etor Gross Matos as their number two next year. Enough of this Morgan Fox, you know, enough wasting their time with that. That's not going anywhere. Uh, you got a lot of good athletes on the edge. It's time for those guys to all take a next step together next year. As Brian Burns has been disappointing as well. Good start, but, you know, coming into the year, we were talking about Brian Burns as a defensive player of the year candidate. And, you know, he's been the fourth best pass rusher in his own draft class behind Max Crosby, Rashawn Gary, and, and you know, Josh Allen. So he's good. He's explosive. He's lengthy. But based on how we talked about him coming into the year as a game-wrecking pass rusher in the next Von Miller, and I was, I was guilty of that, he has not been on that level. He's also taken a, a step backwards in run defense after he looked like he was playing the run better last year. Still a very good player. Still very excited about his future, um, but just didn't continue to refine that group of pass rush, rush uh, pass rush moves and become an elite rusher. Then we've got Frankie Lavu. He's been moving in and out as a hybrid rusher, uh, kind of in the Hassan Reddick role a little bit, uh, but just doing a little bit of everything: rushing the passer, dropping into coverage, confusing defenses. He's a nice role player. He did a lot of this for the Jets in 2020. 
He's doing it now for the Panthers. He, he I think, is a very, uh, just a, a nice cog in the machine to have for a creative defensive coordinator because you can rotate him as a backup and do different stuff with him. And then Kenny Robinson's finally getting some looks. He was someone people were excited about coming out of West Virginia. He goes to the XFL and balls out, but uh, kind of got kicked out of West Virginia. So some off the field questions there. But finally getting on the field for Carolina, tackling well. And it's just good to see him out there because they have not really turned to him. Uh, but a player with potential that was good to just kind of get a look at as you look into next year and, and can see him as a backup safety, maybe their third safety uh, as a group. They definitely got to improve, though. And then Zane Gonzalez was good as a kicker for the Panthers this year after uh, a rocky career. All right, the L.A. Rams... Uh, no Stafford boost, no Odell boost. You know, still got Odell at an 88, which he finally played up to in the wild card round, but was definitely impressed by Odell and what he's done lately. Uh, Matthew Stafford had a great playoff performance. You know, you're always going to think higher about a quarterback when they can play well in the playoffs. We'll see what he does against the Bucks, but I've I've always been a pretty big Stafford stan, and uh, that was big to see him do that. But no movement for those guys quite yet. Uh, but there is some movement on the offense. Cam Akers was just really impressed by his toughness to come back from that Achilles injury so quickly. It's supposed to be like a 12 month recovery and he's out there eight months later and he looks really explosive running guys over playing with fire was just really impressed was a really um, eye opening performance by Cam Akers, even if it wasn't like statistically amazing, but uh, he, he did have a good night. And then Cooper Cup plus three. This is another uh, Madden deal where you know you can only go so high with him because his athletic traits aren't exceptional. I, I wouldn't even describe Cooper Cup's route running as elite. I think it's very good. He runs his release is very good. His acceleration is unparalleled. Like his ability to hit top speed immediately is is his best trait in my opinion. But um, back to the Madden thing, like. Um, he is a more one-dimensional receiver in, in as far as the ways that he beats you because uh, he is more of that short to intermediate weapon for this team. Uh, the game engine, Madden, also doesn't value run after catch as much and it doesn't value run blocking at all. So again, he is the second best receiver in the NFL this year, not named Devontae Adams. In my mind, he's a 95 plus, but because these are Madden ratings, I want to tell you when that number is a little bit off. 99% of these players, it's it accurately shows how I feel about these guys. But in Cooper Cup's case, the formula, the Madden formula isn't quite perfect, but God, he's a monster, man. Uh, the red zone ability lately really picking up the uh, contested catch ball winning ability has really stood out um, but again his run after catch ability like his ability to basically be an undersized tight end uh, as a physical threat for this team it it, al- it opens up everything they want to do schematically and then he's good when they use him uh, as well so cooper cup's a beast uh, I've probably slept on him as offensive player of the year, giving it to Jonathan Taylor. I, I think that might be a mistake. Uh, but then on the O-line, Joseph Noteboom is a very fascinating player. He was a mid-round pick for this Rams team that's been very good at developing offensive linemen out of TCU. And he's now two years in a row kind of gotten opportunities in different spots because of injuries, left tackle and guard especially um, but I really think Noteboom can be the Andrew Whitworth replacement whenever that time comes. He's got size, he's a mauler in the run game, and he's athletic, he's a good pass protector. He's got a lot of upside. The Rams have a very valuable asset in Joseph Noteboom. Coleman Shelton, I, I don't know so much if, if he's got a future there, but uh, did get a start at center and looked okay doing so. So he's going to go up from a 50 to a 59. Not saying a whole lot there, but uh, plus nine. And then on the defense, this this run defense has been the best in the league over this time. Ashawn Robinson's a huge part of that. He has actually been lackluster for them in in his recent years for the Rams, but they've needed a guy to step up. 
Because remember, they they let Brockers go and Sebastian Joseph Day has not been out there. So Ashawn Robinson has had that next man up mentality. He's brought that physicality up front and it's been a difference maker for this run defense. Uh, and then Greg Gaines, he, he is really fun. Um, I, I retweeted that clip of his interaction with Aaron Rodgers where, you know, they talk about how you know, Rogers goes up to Greg Gaines and he's like, Hey, you got, you got the sack. And Greg's like, what? No way. I thought you fought for the yard. And he's like, no, no, it was a zero yard gain. It's a sack. And Greg Gaines just has this massive smile on his face. Um, but then there's a cool moment where Rogers is like, you know, he gets serious for a second. He's like, you're a really good player, man. Like, keep it up. Like you can tell Rogers is like, shit, this guy's really good. And uh, Greg Gaines has over 40 pressures rushing the passer this year. You look at him, white dude, long beard, wears no gloves. Like, you just think he's this tough run defender, right? But no, you go back and look. Like, he had pretty good quickness scores. And uh, he he's a decent pass rusher. And he's winning in, a, in some different ways. So, like, don't just put the mid-round white guy, tough run defender tag on Greg Gaines quite yet. Uh, there could be even more in there for Greg Gaines, who's come on really well lately. He had a dominant game against the Cardinals as a pass rusher. So uh, he has really popped this season. And then Travin Howard, plus six. He's gotten a couple starts at linebacker by by necessity. They've had injuries there. And uh, he's a converted safety out of TCU. Very reminiscent of um, Corey Littleton, who was also kind of that safety type. And you'll remember Corey Littleton in like year three really broke out as a cover linebacker. And that looks to be Travin Howard right now. He's been flying around the field. He's been really good position in coverage. He's been tackling well as well. He's only 220 pounds. He's not a good run defender, but he's been a, a big addition to that coverage unit, as has Dante Dion. They really need uh, um, needed another corner to emerge here. And he's been kind of their third, fourth guy. They've had some injuries. They've been uh, moving some some pieces around. And he's a good cover player. He really is. 5'9", 160 pounds. I remember Dante Dion from Hard Knocks. This dude talks trash. <laughs> he knows that he's undersized and is not afraid uh, to be that annoying short guy that everyone's played basketball with. Um, that's, you know, throwing elbows into your hips and all that stuff that's Dante Dion he's he's just that scrappy short undersized guy but uh, he's really quick and smart on the field and and it's been fun to see him become a impactful coverage player for the Rams and then uh I would love to see Dante Dion just like moss Mike Evans like in (laughs) can you imagine um but then their kicker Matt Gay has been a top three kicker this year Uh, it's been impressive their ability to kind of find special teams guys throughout the last few years all right then we have the seattle seahawks so we have rashad penny i I struggled with star of the week i I felt like micah parsons really deserved it i wanted to make cowboys feel a little bit better rashad penny's a running back not as important but god there's you can't you can't write the story of week 13 through 18 without talking about rashad penny who's a former first round pick with a ton of athletic ability and just could never stay healthy for the Seahawks. But here he is healthy where, where their other starter goes down. And he was the best running back in the NFL in this time. Juice, game changing. You, you know, the, the Seahawks offense was not bad in this stretch. They really weren't. And they wanted to be that outside zone Kyle Shanahan offense, but they had no run game. And Chris Carson's not a great fit for that offense because his top speed's not very good. Rashad Penny, on the other hand, explosive, can get the corner, forces those linebackers to take his speed seriously. And it, you know, Russ started playing better and other things, but like he was a big part of that offense opening up and you've got to bring him back. Uh, Just the fact that this front office spent a first round pick on him, it's like they want him to be that franchise running back. Now you can't pay him too much because he hasn't been able to stay healthy, but God, he looked so good. He looked, dare you say, like Derek, like baby Derek Henry esque. He's not quite as big, but he's got that same like speed train type of ability. And uh, it it was a bright, it was a bright end to the Seahawks season that was really bad. Uh, Colby Parkinson plus one. 
possession guy, really tall, blocks pretty well for a big dude, limited opportunities. He's their third tight end, but I, I like Colby Parkinson. I think he can play. Uh, the offensive line did have their struggles again, again, again. It's just the theme for the Seattle Seahawks forever, it feels like. But Dwayne Brown getting up there in age, man. I mean, I get why the Seahawks have been hesitant to pay him. Most offensive tackles aren't what they see twice a year in uh, Andrew Whitworth, or they aren't uh, Jason Peters for the Bears. Like Most offensive tackles are going to wear down at 36 years old. It does look like that's Dwayne Brown right now. Uh, you're seeing guys just get the edge on him that you haven't seen over the last couple of years. I do, I do think it's age with him. Gabe Jackson, I think it's scheme. And he was always in that West Coast, inside zone, heavy offense. Whereas the Seahawks, it's a lot of moving pockets, uh, get on the move blocking. That's not so much Gabe Jackson's game. I actually talked about that in my Seahawks deep dive, and we've, we've kind of seen that play out. He's still been a, a good player. You know, he's strong and smart and all that, but uh, just physically speaking, it's not the ideal scheme fit. Uh, and then over the defensive side of the ball, some good, some bad. Alton Robinson, bad. Uh, it looked like after his rookie season, he was poised for a step up. Really physically talented player, had a kind of a athletic pedigree of a top 50 prospect or so, but just didn't have the production. And just, again, just fell off this year. Um, didn't match the ability to win with power that he did as a, in his rookie season. Uh, Rasheem Green, he's getting a lot of playing time. He's got like seven or 800 snaps. He's got a bunch of sacks this year. A lot of it's just high effort stuff. You don't really see him winning one-on-ones or getting off blocks a lot, but he's an athletic guy, eh, whatever. He's, at this point, I'm not counting on him to be a full-time starter, but maybe a high effort, big bodied role player. Uh, Daryl Taylor, on the other hand, has been fun to watch. He's uh, kind of reshaped his body a little bit to be a little more juicy on the outside, uh, a little more bend around the edge. He's, he's been getting after the quarterback well, dropping into coverage, doing some different stuff for the Seahawks, and he's been their best uh, edge guy outside of um, Dunlap. So uh, good trajectory for Daryl Taylor, who, who they spent a second round pick on. Uh, Jordan Brooks, the first round pick. He's a, he's a heat-seeking missile, man. I feel like I say that every time about Jordan Brooks, but that is the that is the profile on him. He is coming downhill. He is going to see ball, hit ball, and that's about it. You know, the second you ask him to go backwards, he basically has no idea what he's doing, but he's a really good tackler. He's a high effort player. I get why Pete Carroll likes this guy. He's not bad. Um, you can do a lot worse for a first round linebacker though he is added to the group of first round linebackers that just don't cover well, which is pretty much all of them. Uh, then Bobby Wagner, this one hurt a little bit because I, I still think he's one of the five best linebackers in the NFL. First ballot Hall of Famer, still a really good player. I just, you know, at 93, it was the best linebacker in the NFL. I feel pretty confident saying he's not that anymore. And, you know, he hasn't had any individual games where you felt like you had to lower him. Uh, but now as we're taking more of a retroactive look at the whole season and, you know, week 13 through 18 too, like it just felt like, all right, it's, it's time to lower him a little bit. He's, he's not the same old Bobby Wagner, but he's still damn good. And then Cody Barton actually started the last two games of the season. He was a third round pick out of Utah who I, I really like big athletic dude, really smart, played in that Utah defense that's very similar schematically to what Pete Carroll and these guys want to do. And he looked really good in those two weeks. So like, honestly, they didn't, they didn't really miss a beat at that linebacker position. Um, good player. I, I think he eventually could be the Bobby Wagner replacement if Bobby Wagner ever stops playing really good football. Uh, and then John Reed is another interesting name. Uh, it's almost like DJ Reed all over again here. So, you know, DJ Reed is playing on the outside. He's five foot nine. Another team deemed he was too short. He got pissed, came to a different team that was willing to play him, and he balled out. Like, athletic guy, really smart, good cover player. Uh, John Reed reminds me of that story. Undersized guy, gets released. The Seahawks pick him up. It's just really funny to me that the Seahawks, of all teams, who are the reason the league is obsessed with 
six foot one, six foot two corners because of the Legion of Boom defense. So the Seahawks have the Legion of Boom defense. The league becomes obsessed with six foot one corners. And then these guys become available to the Seahawks, guys like John Reed, DJ Reed. And then the Seahawks pick those guys up and make them starters. It's incredibly ironic. Um, but John Reed, super quick dude out of Penn State. I think the Texans gave up on him way too quick. I didn't understand that. Um, but he popped for me at Penn State because of his ability to move in the slot. And they've really struggled with this slot position. They've tried Marquise Blair there for some reason, who's like a downhill free safety. They've tried Ugo Amadi, who's not a perfect fit. I like Ugo, but he has struggled in coverage. Teams have really gone at him. And John Reed kind of comes in, gets in the rotation, and plays much better coverage than Ugo Amadi was doing. So keep an eye on John Reed as a slot corner for them next year. Uh, and then Sidney Jones as well, really good redemption arc here. Uh, never should have been let go by Urban Meyer. He effed up. Um, he's a good starter at this point. He was really good last year. He was at a time viewed as a first round corner, but came into the league, struggled on the Eagles, tough assignments, and then ends up in Jacksonville, redeems himself. Urban Meyer lets him go. Now he's here in Seattle balling out. I would be surprised if they don't keep Sidney Jones around as the starter next year with DJ Reed and then maybe John Reed in the slot. And that could be the best trio of corners that they've had in Seattle in a long, long time. So uh, they're figuring some stuff out in the secondary that was a huge question coming into the year. Uh, and then Jason Myers, it, he's interesting. He is a, uh, a bipolar per season kicker. A really good year for the Jets, then a bad year. They let him go. He comes to Seattle, has a great year, and now he's had a bad year. So he'll probably ball out next year and be an all-pro kicker. But this year, definitely not so much. And lastly, the Minnesota Vikings. I'm going to lower Kellen Mond. I know he only came in for four snaps. The one throw he made... Uh, he tried to throw a pick six on. He couldn't start over Sean Mannion. Everything I've heard is that he has looked just horrific in practice. And I I just, I think this is warranted based on everything you've heard. The Sean Mannion experience being as bad as it was and Kellen Mond being even worse. It, it just, he has a long way to go. And I uh, kind of heard that stuff in the summer when they first saw him, like, he just, there's something missing there with Kellen Mond. Hopefully he can figure it out this summer with a, you know, full season under his belt and all that stuff. He's got the physical ability, but uh, it's not looking great for Kellen Mond. And then Amir Smith-Marset is going to go up too. Really good finish to his season. Uh, pretty sure, you know, he missed a lot of time with injury, I think. But good to see a guy <clears throat> that had, you know, a lot of hype as like a mid-round, uh, late-round sleeper for them. They've had a lot of hits in the late rounds. Uh, Adam Thielen, K.J. Osborne, Thielen obviously a you know pickup, um, free agent pickup, Stephon Diggs, you name it. Um, so people really peaked, uh, perked up when they saw Amir Smith-Marset here with his athleticism. And uh, Week 18 comes out, 100 yards, big touchdown. Looks pretty sweet. So someone to keep an eye on next year as a breakout opportunity. KJ Osborne did kind of break out this year. He, I wouldn't be surprised if this team considers moving off of Adam Thielen, just because Smith Marset and Osborne look pretty sweet. Maybe you give them an opportunity or those guys can be really good wide receiver three, wide receiver fours that continue to develop behind Adam Thielen, both great options. Um, but those guys look again, pretty sweet. Then we've got Tyler Conklin losing my voice here. You know, we did a two-hour podcast yesterday, two-hour studs and duds last week, so just bear with me here. Um, but Tyler Conklin has been a stable impact for them, pair of hand, a nice pair of hands, good blocker. He's not a starter. He just He's so slow, but he's a good number two tight end. And then this O-line is like the biggest uh, source of optimism for the Vikings moving forward, which, you know, honestly, I know some Vikings fans that if I said your season ends by firing Mike Zimmer and you feel good about your offensive line heading into 2022, some Vikings fans might say, I'll take that because their O-line has been such a disaster and they're ready to move on from Zimmer. Uh, so Derisaw, 
looked really good in this time period. Settled in as a pass protector, was mauling dudes as a run blocker. And a lot of times we see this where guys miss time in a rookie season early on because of an injury. They, they get set back and then they don't even really show any flashes and it's just a wasted season. So for Derrissaw even to come out and look solid, I think is a big deal, let alone to come out and look like a legitimately good left tackle. That's, that's huge. Um, it, it makes you feel a little bit better about the fact that Kellen Mond looks like a wasted pick and, uh, you know, um, uh, the right guard from Ohio State that they drafted did, couldn't even see the field. But Derrissaw looks legit, just as we all kind of thought that was a big steal. It's looking like that's the case as they head into next year. And then Brian O'Neill at right tackle. This guy's underrated as hell. One of the best right tackles in the NFL. Continues to get better and better and better every year as a guy that played tight end in, in college and is still like learning new things about the position every week. And uh, just a good worker, a great athlete. They've got their tackle situation figured out. Left guard, Ezra Cleveland, is really settling in at guard. Excellent run blocker with his get off in this scheme. Still has a lot of work to do as a pass protector, just like his running mate next to him at center. But getting a better left tackle there will just help everything. So really, it's just right guard that they got to figure out. And Wyatt Davis, I think, was the uh, right guard out of Ohio State that I, I couldn't think of. Maybe next year he gets on the field and you have a, just a brilliant young athletic offensive line there but uh, they've invested in this group they needed these guys to hit Derisaw first rounder O'Neal a second rounder Ezra Cleveland a second rounder uh, obviously Bradbury a first rounder they've needed these guys to hit and it looks like they've hit Bradbury still sucks in pass pro but he's a good run blocker uh, and then over to the defense Armin Watts has been getting after the quarterback really well lately uh, it's been you know he's got a lot of sacks and he's got what like six seven eight sacks this year that's uh, not um, consistent with the amount of pass uh, with the amount of pressures he's gotten, but he's finishing and he's he's a strong dude. I think he can be a nice third piece. I, I don't know if he's a full time starter or not, but he's shown some really fun flashes this year. Same with DJ Wanham. You know, both these guys big sack numbers, but you look at their um, down to down grading, it's not necessarily super high. Uh, Kenny Willickis gets in there at the end of the season. Fun Michigan State player. Uh, I got to kind of um, meet him at the Senior Bowl and just kind of get to understand his, like, uh, approach to the game. And um, fun to see him get out there. He, he understands the game. It's just a lot of stuff he can't do because he's not athletic at all. Um, but comes out, I think he gets he two sacks week 18. Waiting till the last game of your second season to show anything, you know, isn't best ringing endorsement of a bright future, but still a fun player nonetheless. And then these linebackers, a lot of movement. So Blake Lynch has been kind of just a special teamer for them, but he's gotten little spots of playing time and he's just shown to be a very good tackler uh, and he's a really athletic guy. So just kind of fighting his way up, not in the starting range yet, but someone to keep an eye on. Nick Vigil at his, his worst season, veteran linebacker. I, I can't imagine he'll be back. And then I, I got to lower Eric Kendrick's uh, similar to what we said about Bobby Wagner, just, you know, not his best season. And, and especially as a run defender with Kendricks, the last couple of years, he's taken massive steps up as far as his ability to get nasty in the trenches, not miss tackles, not give up lanes. He's been a pretty bad run defender this year. He really has. I still love Kendricks in coverage. I still think he's incredibly valuable to this defense, but um, did have a down year as a run defender, no doubt. And then in the secondary, Cam Dantzler finished really strong. And it does beg the question of, like, shouldn't he have been playing the whole time? He's lengthy. He's tough. He's got pretty solid speed. Um, they released uh, Breland, like, week 14. It was actually the day of my wedding. My uh, best men, uh, my groomsmen were joking, like, um, your, your wedding gift to us is that they released... <laughs> Breland. But anyway, Dantzler started from that point on and was actually really solid coverage, tackled well, was an upgrade to that secondary. Uh, he should be a starter for this team heading into next year. And then uh, Mackenzie Alexander in the slot, still a really good run defender. He, he's always been nasty in the slot. Good tackler, sheds blocks, all that stuff. But God, he was getting attacked in coverage from basically the get-go this year. So you kind of get what you get with Mackenzie Alexander if you're going to start him in the slot. And then Josh Metellus out of Michigan, 
Uh, plus one good tackling performance last game of the year gets a start. So uh, building something in the next season. And then their kicker, Greg Joseph, a weird way to end the series because it's not like he had a great year, but we had him all the way down at a 68. He was fine. You know, he was good enough that they didn't need to release him. He did miss some big kicks, but made some big kicks as well. Uh, so Greg Joseph plus four. And just like that, about four hours of recording later, Studs and Duds is done for the 2021 season. Thank you so much for watching. These are massive projects for me, but it takes a lot for you guys to watch up to this point as well. So thank you so much for your viewership, your support of the channel, all that stuff. As far as next year goes, I think I'm gonna have a more consistent Studs and Duds schedule, but uh, I'm gonna have less of them. I'm gonna do it at the start of every month. So it'll be October 1st, November, December, January, uh, that January episode, I'll probably wait till like the end of the regular season and do like these again. Um, but that's the plan for next year is to do every four weeks. And hopefully that'll open up some more time for me to do more film related content and not get quite as exhausted by this series that is a really demanding task for me. Uh, so I just wanted to preview a little bit about uh, studs and duds into the future and thank you guys one more time for soaking this up the the passion for this series is off the charts so uh, thank you guys so much for that i hope you enjoyed please do hit that like button if you did and enjoy divisional round football peace out